Happy to have with us here at Ash 2011 from the Cross the Pond, Claire Harrison, MD, from Guy's Hospital in London in the UK. Thanks for being here. Hi, my pleasure. So you've got lots to talk about um, regarding updates from Comfort 2. What would you like to share? Okay, so um, the uh, Comfort 2 study, as you know, was a the phase three study which we performed in Europe comparing ruxolitinib with best available therapy so standard patient care for patients with intermediate risk to or above myelofibrosis. As you know at ASCO this year we reported that this study so highly successfully reached its primary endpoint and patients had a highly significant reduction in splenomegaly with ruxolitinib compared to best available therapy and at the ASH meeting this year we're updating data with regard to splenomegaly and looking at which types of patients were more likely to respond to ruxolitinib than um, or not. So we've done an analysis of all the patients treated with ruxolitinib and asked the question does it matter if you're a woman or a man, does it matter if you have the V617F mutation or not, how about starting dose, how about the patients with a really big spleen versus the patients with a less big spleen, how about if you have primary myelofibrosis versus post-ET or post-PV myelofibrosis and uh, the striking thing was actually that patients in all of these subgroups actually significantly benefited compared to best standard of care therapies and um, looking at trying to pick out which particular patients were going to respond best actually we couldn't because all of them were responding really well. Um, one uh, interesting finding was that the degree of spleen reduction did correlate with dose so we were starting patients on a slightly higher dose if their platelet count was over 200 and a slightly lower dose if it was less than 200. But um, still patients were benefiting regardless of all those factors which is very reassuring and uh, indicates that there isn't a specific group of patients that we should be picking out to target those for spleen size response. The second uh, finding from Comfort 2, as you know, was that patients had a very gratifying and significant response in terms of their symptom control. And as you know, patients with myelofibrosis often have very severe and uh, quite significant constitutional symptoms. And uh, as a clinician treating patients, we see that these patients respond very quickly with ruxolitinib. Um, but what we wanted to do was to be able to analyse all the data from the three quality of life instruments we used in Comfort 2, so the ECOG, the ORTC QLQC30 and the functional assessment of uh, cancer and lymphoma treatment scores, so the fat limb scores, and compare them across the patients with, treated with ruxolitinib versus best standard of care. And in the analysis which we presented at this meeting, we were able to uh, demonstrate using very rigorous statistics um, that patients benefit across time and uh, at using all of these scales when compared to best available therapy. Furthermore, we've been able to combine an analysis of the Comfort One, so the sister trial where ruxolitinib was compared with placebo. So we looked at the placebo controlled patients at their quality of life and compared them to the best available therapy patients in Comfort Two and compared their quality of life. And my uh, good friend and colleague Ruben Mazer has been able to show that actually um, standard treatments as we suspected, really aren't addressing quality of life issues for these patients. The last thing to update um, colleagues from with regard to Comfort 2 in this meeting is that uh, we also have an abstract um, suggesting or exploring rather the opportunity to manage anemia which is an on-target effect with ruxolitinib. And in this abstract uh, we report a number of patients whose anemia was managed successfully with erythropoietin, which allowed them to continue at a higher dose of ruxolitinib, which is um, very gratifying and a handy kind of practical tip when you're managing a disease. Um, other highlights for me at this meeting are the update um, from Serge Vestovsek and the Comfort One investigators with regard to survival. And I suppose there's something to say with regard to Comfort Two is, 
that uh, com the Comfort 2 trial was not designed to assess survival. But we very much look forward to being able to assess this um, in some way at the future time. But I'm very pleased to see the very significant data from Comfort 1 supporting a survival advantage for patients treated with roxalitinib. You mentioned Dr. Surge and we visited with him as well. You seem to have the same level of passion and excitement that he does about roxalitinib. Have you ever been a part of anything so life-changing for your patients? Well, I think um, for me personally, it's probably the highlight of my career and it is incredibly personally gratifying to be able to, be, to give a drug to a patient that makes such a massive difference to their quality of life. Um, and it's a huge privilege to be part of developing that drug and bringing it into the public domain. I think um, it's a message for patients as well as a message for clinicians. I think um, one cause for concern that's been highlighted recently was the um, concern about stopping the drug and adverse events on stopping the drug. So um, in my experience, I haven't had a problem with that, and uh, nor did we identify a problem with that in the COMFORT2 trial, probably because um, the patients were on what we now know is an established and proper dose for drug and there was correct advice about tapering the drug dose at the time of stopping. Great news, congratulations, thanks for stopping by and sharing it. Thanks very much. Okay, Claire Harrison, MD from Guy's Hospital in London, UK with an update on Comfort 2.